Welcome to the Benzo Free Podcast, your home for an honest, straightforward, and personal discussion about anti-anxiety drugs, their effects, and how to deal with dependence and withdrawal. Whether you have taken benzodiazepines, Z drugs, or any other tranquilizers, know someone who has, or you just want help dealing with chronic anxiety and insomnia, this is your podcast. I'm your host, D.E. Foster, author of the book, Benzo Free, The World of Anti-Anxiety Drugs and the Reality of Withdrawal. I'm so glad you joined us today. Please stick around and let me bend your ear for a few minutes. It just might feel a little better on the other side. Hello there, this is Dee, and welcome to episode 31 of the Benzo Free Podcast. So, how are you doing today? How, how are the symptoms? Are you keeping busy? Um, exercising when you can, keeping your mind positive, you know, finding little things to help lift your spirits each day. Me? Oh, I'm doing well, thanks for asking. <laughs> I know you were hoping probably for some 25-minute intro again today, <laughs> but I just don't have it in me. Yeah, I may have gotten a bit carried away last week, which I do from time to time. Actually, I rarely plan for the intros to last much longer than 5-10 minutes tops, but when I start writing the script, I just seem to keep going, and then when I record and edit and look back at the time, I'm surprised. <laughs> Anyway, but you know what? Today, I am going to keep it brief, I promise. In fact, I'm going to keep it really brief. Today's format will follow our normal routine. We will have our intro, mailbag, and benzo story, and close out with our moment of peace. Our feature today is Top 20 Things to Remember in Benzo Withdrawal, and this is part two of our two-part series. Last week, we covered the first nine of the series, and today we'll follow up with the remaining 11. And before we move on, we need feedback. Questions, comments, stories, suggestions, corrections, additions, or even where Waldo is these days, anything. I'd love to hear your feedback. This is your podcast, and the more content I can share from you, the more Benzo Free becomes the community it was designed to be. So please, tell us what you think. Visit our feedback form at benzofree.org slash feedback or email us at podcast at benzofree.org. And of course, you can also comment directly on the podcast blog itself for others to see. And don't forget to subscribe to our mailing list at benzofree.org slash subscribe. And please remember that the Benzo Free podcast is for informational purposes only and should never be considered medical advice. If you are listening to this podcast on one of our providers, please leave feedback on that carrier. This helps new listeners find us. Okay, that's the end of that intro. Let's move on to our mailbag. Today I have one comment and one question, which were both posted directly on our podcast blog for others to see. I thought it might be a nice change to answer a couple of questions from there this time. The first one is from Lori. Just a few days ago, Lori commented the following on our podcast post for episode number 11, Benzo Belly, Our Gut in Withdrawal. Lori writes, I am 25 minutes in and I have yet to hear anything about Benzo Belly. I'm struggling like crazy with it and trying to find some answers. For those of us in this horrible dilemma, we need a podcast that moves along more quickly. Thanks. Well, thank you, Lori. I really appreciate your comment. I really do. And I know you probably were a first-time listener and may not hear this response, but I did post a short reply online, which I hope she reads. Lori made a point, and a, and a good point, one which I have noticed myself. I often get carried away in our introduction, as I just mentioned on this intro, too. The mailbag can also get a bit long sometimes in my answers. In case you haven't noticed, I like to talk. Like I've said this before, that's one of the reasons I do a podcast. But still, the last thing I want is for people in distress not to be able to find the info they're looking for. So let's do two things here. First, I'm going to shorten up the episode some over the coming weeks. I, I've been attempting to do this for a couple of months now, and considering last week was one of our longest yet, it's clear I'm going in the wrong direction. <laughs> Did I mention that I like to talk? 
Still, I do think shortening our episodes up is a good idea, partly because it takes a lot of work for me to put together an hour-long episode. 30 to 45 minutes is a better time, in my opinion, and definitely easier to produce. I may not have quite reached that time frame in today's episode. I really don't know until I get done recording it and seeing how it turns out. But I am going to try working towards that in coming episodes. But that still doesn't solve the problem of someone trying to find a specific section of a podcast, especially someone in distress. And this is a problem I think I can solve. Starting in today's episode, I am going to add an index at the top of the show notes. It will state the time index of each section. So if you want to find the mailbag, you can skip ahead to say 18 minutes into the podcast and there it is. I will continue to do this in all episodes going forward the best I can. And if I have time, I'll also try to add it to the previous ones, but that may take some time to do that. I hope this helps, Lori, and I really appreciate your comment. I definitely heard it, and it does help me know what you are looking for. Thanks for writing. The second one is from Kay in Toronto a little over a month ago. Kay commented the following on our podcast post for episode number five, Managing the Fear of Benzo Withdrawal. Kay writes, Hi D, I have not started to taper yet and I'm already having withdrawal symptoms like mild vertigo, insomnia, anxiety, depression, burning skin, heart palpitations and pain and cognitive impairment. My question is, should all this be gone before you start to taper at each level? Or will some or most of these symptoms follow me through each taper cut? How do you know when to cut more? I know I will need to listen to my body. I just want to know if symptoms are tolerable or gone before you step down. Also, thank you for having such an informative and encouraging sight. I am on some forums that have really upset me and scared me into imagining the worst. Like you said in this fear piece, I am going to try when I begin my taper to take it moment by moment, and when I get overwhelmed, I will try to accept it, reframe it, and get through it. I am really enjoying your podcast as they help to keep me distracted. Kay in Toronto. Well, thanks, Kay. I really appreciate your question, and it's, a, it's an excellent one to follow up on. As you probably know, withdrawal symptoms during normal use are very common, and they will also happen during taper. During normal use, we call this tolerance withdrawal. Um, there's also inner dose withdrawal, which happens between doses of short-acting benzos. Tolerance withdrawal is actually a subject we haven't talked too much about on the podcast, and I am already in the brainstorming phase of a feature on it with a friend. I'm hoping it will come together and we'll be able to produce that soon. The bad news is that at any phase of your taper, whether it's before you started or during your taper, these symptoms may not go away. But then again, they might between phases. It's really up to you, and I know you mentioned that in your question, but it's up to you to decide when the right time. It's, it's what you can handle, what you're comfortable with, what you think you can manage before you decide to take the next cut. I've talked about homeostasis many times in this podcast, and that is the primary process at play here. Your, your body has adjusted to the drug's effects on the GABA receptors and other physiological mechanisms in an attempt to return to the so-called normal state. And since your current dose of medication or your latest cut is no longer giving the benefit it did, especially if you're tapering, then you are starting the withdrawal process or you're continuing the withdrawal process. Unfortunately, this may not go away between cuts. It may not go away until several months after your last dose. That is part of withdrawal for some people. Some new symptoms may arise and others may wane, but if you're going to wait for you to be 100% free of your symptoms before you start your next cut or before you start to taper, you may be waiting a long time. Now, please remember, I am not giving you any advice on how to do your taper. That is something you need to work out with your doctor. It's between you and your doctor. I can't advise you on anything medical. I'm just trying to help provide some information that I've picked up along the way, and maybe it might help you have that conversation. If it were me, I would focus mostly on my mindset, which it sounds like you're already doing. And I would ask myself if I'm stable enough to take the next step. 
I'm sure you already know that it may get harder as you move along on your taper. I wish I could say otherwise, but I won't lie to you here. That's not something I do. But I have a feeling you're going to get through this just fine. It sounds like you're doing the right things. You, you've you already educated yourself and are looking for the information you need to, to ease this transition to a life without benzos. I think you're doing fine. Don't be in a hurry and don't let anyone push you. When you're ready, if you wish, then take your next cut. Work with your doctor, find a nice schedule, but also have that schedule be flexible. And if you hit a rough patch, slow down. You'll be fine. This is only temporary and you will get through it. And that closes out our mailbag today. Now on to our Benzo story. Today, we have a story from Todd in New Orleans, Louisiana. Let's hear from Todd. This is a beast. I'm struggling. I've survived nearly 22 years of paraplegia, but this seems almost insurmountable. That's saying a lot. My present psychiatrist has decided she no longer wants to refill my Valium. Basically, leaving me without a medication I'm dependent on due to iatrogenic means. I've been seeing her since 2012. Under her care, I took Xanax daily. She even tripled my daily dose. When I began seeing her, I was taking one milligram, sometimes two milligrams a day. By the peak, I was at four milligrams a day. My doctor not informing how horrific withdrawal is, and having taken only 2 milligrams in 72 hours while hospitalized in February 2018 for a UTI, I had a false sense of my dependency. Basically, I naively convinced myself it was a matter of just getting out of my usual routine. So, I complied with a cold turkey detox in a hospital setting in April 2018. Almost everything I've read since advises against cold turkey detoxes. But I did bounce back after about five weeks of a rough withdrawal because my psychiatrist put me on low doses of various benzodiazepines. Many people I tell that to are confused as to why she would do a carousel of benzodiazepines with me. Clonopin to Valium to Ativan, then back to Valium. This carousel caused me to take two for a very short time, and when I told her, she reacted as if her bottom line was at risk, and I was a culprit of some sort. Thus, she instructed that we would go off of them completely. I complied because when you're still on the medication, you're still feeling pretty well and confident. When I thought I had it all under control, about two weeks into taking anything, it began to hit me. I felt sick, sank into despair, began isolating, confining myself to bed, and a plethora of many troubling symptoms. I tried waiting it out, but it wasn't helping, so I slowly retreated back to the medication. I had to make myself able to manage, take care of myself, and be more engaged. The doctor who once readily gave me benzodiazepines as if it wasn't a problem now seems to repudiate the regimen in any form. I am hurt and feel betrayed because my psychiatrist knows I live somewhat of a hermetic life, so I'm with myself and my thoughts. There are no fancy inpatient treatment options for me. I'm trying to find one presently, as most don't accommodate severely disabled people. As much as I don't want to be dependent, I hate the symptoms with not having the medication. It makes for an already difficult life seem that much less to live for. My hopes for all in this battle. Wow, thank you, Todd. I, I really appreciate you sharing this story, and, and I'm so sorry for your struggles. I hope things get better for you, and I hope you can find the support you're looking for. You know, like so many others who have submitted their story or reach out with a comment or question, Todd and I have been corresponding for a little over a month now, and I've gotten to know him better, and I'm the better for it. I wish I had a real clear answer for you, Todd. I have no idea what it's like to deal with paraplegia, so I can't even, I can't even pretend to know what those difficulties are. And to have Benza withdrawal on top of that, I get how this can seem insurmountable. But it's not. Please hang in there. Keep pushing through. You're doing great, and you are going to get through this. 
okay? We're here to help. Others are to help. Keep reaching out. Keep getting support. Take care of yourself, and please, keep writing and keep in touch. We'll talk soon. And don't forget, we still need stories. Short ones, long ones, even if it's a paragraph or two, I love sharing your story here, and I think it really benefits you by sharing, and it benefits others who get to listen to it. So please go to our feedback form at benzofree.org slash feedback or email us at podcast at benzofree.org to share your story. And don't forget, you can also share it in your own voice like we had last week. Always happy to receive those too. Today our feature topic is 20 Tips for Success in Benzo Withdrawal. Like I said in the introduction, this is part two in our two-part series. Last week, we intended to cover the first ten in the list, but as you may have noticed, I only recorded nine of them. I skipped right over number seven. <laughs> Sorry about that. I didn't notice it until I completely exported the final file, so I added that tag intro just to let you know what happened. I hope that worked out okay. And much like I did last week, before I dive into our topic today... And I know this is redundant since I said this a couple times in our mailbag too, but I just need to remind everyone I am not a medical professional and this is not medical advice, nor any advice for that matter. It's just some tips I picked up along the way from articles and studies or from corresponding with you, and I thought I'd share them with you today. Take them or leave them, that's up to you. These 20 tips are strictly for informational purposes, and as always, I recommend you work with your doctor. Now let's Start off with the one we missed from last week. Number seven, develop your toolbox. Benzos are most frequently prescribed for two conditions, anxiety and insomnia. I realize that you may have had yours prescribed for something different, as I did for stomach distress. But still, most of us suffer from one or both of these conditions. In benzo withdrawal, for most people, Finding ways to manage anxiety and insomnia can go a long way in making withdrawal easier. And to help with that, there are many tools. Some of these may work for you, some may not. But when you find the ones which help you the most, you will have built your toolbox. Let's look at a few of the top tools which people use, and maybe one or two of these you'll want to add to your toolbox. First off is counseling. Counseling is the go-to treatment for mental illness. It has been around the longest and has had the most long-term success. Although the specifics and methodologies have changed over time, talk therapy has stood firm. In my opinion, the most critical step is to find a counselor who you feel comfortable with. It may take several tries, and that's okay. But this is a long-term relationship, and it's worth getting right. Another tool is breathing, one of the quickest and most effective ways of managing anxiety, especially for acute anxiety or panic attacks, are breathing exercises. Taking deep, slow breaths helps us pull back from a stressful situation. It, it allows our bodies to reset, and it allows our mind time to process what is going on. This is one that I believe should be in everyone's toolbox. There are a lot of techniques for this. so. Go online if you're interested and find the one that suits you best or speak to your counselor or do some research on the other boards. You can find some information on these in many places. Meditation is another one and this helps both anxiety and insomnia. If I had to pick one simple mental tool that meant the most to me throughout my withdrawal and in the years following, it would have to be meditation. I was never a meditator before benzo withdrawal. Sitting still was not something that appealed to me. I, I was always on the go and needed constant stimulation. As I prepared for my taper, my doctor encouraged me to find ways of stabilizing my anxiety and fear. Around that time, more and more scientific studies were coming out about the benefits of meditation, so I thought I'd give it a try. I downloaded some guided meditations, found a few free podcasts, and even discovered some excellent resources at my local library. Their messages spoke to me and helped me ease into the practice. Each, each morning, I would try to sit quietly, relax, and, and see if I could calm my mind. Now, all that sounds good, <laughs> but trust me when I say that this was not an overnight miracle. Not by any means. Meditation can be very challenging. 
especially for some anxiety-prone, benzodependent, TV-addicted guy with ADHD like me. But I didn't give up. For the past six years now, I have been meditating, and just like any skill, it continually takes practice. And another one is yoga. Yoga also helps anxiety and insomnia. There are all types of yoga classes for all types of needs. Hot yoga and core yoga, these are more geared toward cardio and fitness. While others like vinyasa and yin are more focused on stretching and the meditative practice. I got my cardio workout separately, so I usually preferred more meditative types of yoga, which help my mind as well as my body. One of the most significant benefits of yoga for someone in withdrawal is the stretching. Our muscles are locked up and crave to be relaxed and loosened, and yoga is perfect for that. Tai Chi is a similar practice with much of the same benefits, so if that's better for you, check that out. If you're interested in yoga or Tai Chi, check out a DVD at the library or visit YouTube or take a class as I did. Remember, though, that during withdrawal, our muscles can be very tight, like I said. As with exercise, make sure you ease into it and don't overdo it. Listen to your body and adjust. I think of yoga as therapy for my mind and body. It's something kind I did for my body during this trying time of withdrawal. These are just the tip of the iceberg. There are hundreds of tools available for your toolbox. These can include listening to music, especially calming, relaxing music, limiting your screen time, especially before bed, taking walks in nature, using essential oils or aromatherapy or huga, which I talked about in a previous episode, singing, dancing, volunteering, reading, acupuncture, massage, Epsom salt baths help those muscles relax and might relax you before bed. Pet therapy, if you got a pet, pets are wonderful. This list can go on and on, and there are choices for everyone, so find the tools that work for you. Developing your toolbox is important, and it's easier to do it before you start your taper than in the middle, but either way, it's good to work on some tools to help you manage your anxiety, your insomnia, and get you through this hard time. Number 11, keep physically active. Exercise, even if it's very mild, is essential during withdrawal, if you can do it. And it doesn't take much. Studies have shown that the first 20 minutes of exercise garners the most health benefits. Even if you can't do anything else, a brisk 20-minute walk every day can do wonders. It's not just about exercise. It's also about just being active. Yes, there are days when you might feel you can't even move, but when you can, do so each day. Keep your body healthy and moving as much as you can. Professor Ashton said in the Ashton Manual, Regular to moderate exercise is recommended during withdrawal. The aim is to lead a healthy lifestyle, which by definition includes some exercise in a form that is enjoyable for you. Finding an exercise that you enjoy doing, that you look forward to doing, is probably the most important part. If you don't like it, you won't continue doing it. Find what you enjoy and keep at it. Number 12. Eat healthy. Diet during withdrawal is a hotly debated topic. Everyone is different. And that is never more obvious than with diet. Some will swear that all should avoid this substance or that during withdrawal, and others may protest that that same substance is what got them through withdrawal. Eating a well-balanced diet during withdrawal is important. But what that looks like will vary person to person. Some swear that a vegetarian diet helped them recover. Others swear that that type of diet just makes withdrawal much worse. Others have specific foods they can't eat. During withdrawal, some people have problems with MSG, honey, sugar, artificial sweeteners, food additives, preservatives, and other tasty stuff like that. Many of these are thought to be food sensitivities that people either had prior to withdrawal or may have even developed during their withdrawal process. Others, like MSG, might have chemical compositions that are specifically difficult for some withdrawing from benzos. But we can take limiting our diet too far. Professor Ashton said, Advice to cut out white flour, white sugar, etc. 
may help certain individuals, but I have also observed that overly restrictive diets can have adverse effects. You know, sugar is a big trigger for some, and it was for me. Even before I started withdrawal, I had already cut back on sugar in various ways, including eliminating soda and heavy desserts. Unfortunately, during withdrawal, this wasn't enough. Sugar would really rev me up, and my symptoms would go haywire. I've never been a fan of artificial sweeteners, so that wasn't really an option for me. Instead, I slowly reduced my intake of sugar and similar sweeteners even more throughout my taper and withdrawal. And it stuck with me, well, mostly. <laughs> I, I still am limited in my sugar intake, but more for general health reasons and weight loss than anything else now. I can eat sugar now with little effect on my symptoms, but unfortunately it does still have an effect on my waistline. <laughs> Just use your own common sense, work with a nutritionist, work with your doctor, find what works for you during this time. Number 13, drink healthy. Let's start with the big one here, alcohol. In my experience, this is probably one of the most divisive subjects on the benzo boards. There are people in the benzo community who believe that even one drop of alcohol is going to ruin your entire withdrawal. There are others who say they drank throughout their withdrawal with no complications. This controversy is not going to be solved here, not by a long shot. I spent a few pages talking about alcohol in my book, and I'm not going to attempt to restate it here. But let me cover a couple basics. Here's what the website Benzo Buddies has to say on the topic. Alcohol acts on some of the same GABA receptors in the brain as benzodiazepines. Your receptors are already vulnerable from the benzodiazepine withdrawal. It is most likely for this reason that many report alcohol intensifies their withdrawal symptoms. Now, much like benzo buddies, most experts agree that avoiding alcohol completely during benzo taper is a good idea, and I have to agree. Since alcohol acts on the same GABA receptors which we are trying to let heal, it just makes sense to stay away from it, especially during this incredibly trying time. Alcohol is not the only liquid substance that can aggravate withdrawal. Caffeine is another common one to cause problems. Caffeine is a stimulant. When your body is already overly anxious, then it makes sense that adding a stimulant to the mix might just make things worse. And that is the case for many people, especially for those who are struggling with insomnia. The state of hypersensitivity that many of us go through during withdrawal makes us more vulnerable and responsive to the effects of food, drink, and drugs. We can easily overreact and one cup of coffee can feel like we had five. Like anything else, this is up for you to decide, but you can always use trial and error. See if caffeine revs up your symptoms. If it does, then it might be a good thing to avoid during this time. Number 14. Medicate with caution. Medication is a tricky one during withdrawal, like as if the last two I talked about were any better, but... Most of us know that additional benzodiazepines, or non-benzodiazepines, Z-drugs, are usually not a good idea since they only complicate withdrawal. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. That is, unless, of course, you're using another benzo as a substitution for your taper, such as diazepam. Or also, most experts agree that single doses for medical procedures are okay and do not complicate your withdrawal. Opioids are another class of drugs that can have dangerous side effects when taken with benzos during normal use or during your taper. Many painkillers can create a combination effect which can be very dangerous and even lethal in some circumstances. Please speak with your doctor if you've been prescribed an opioid painkiller while you are taking benzodiazepines. Another one is quinolones or fluoroquinolones which are a specific class of antibiotics. These can create problems during withdrawal. I spoke about this one in our mailbag last week. Again, if you find yourself prescribed one, please speak with your doctor to see if there is an alternative. We also touched on supplements and vitamins in last week's mailbag, but it is too complicated and needs far more time than we have here to share. Ashton did say this on the subject. 
a normal healthy diet which includes generous amounts of fruits and vegetables and a source of protein and fats from meat or vegetables and not too much pure sugar or junk foods provides all the nutrients a person needs there is no general need for dietary supplements or extra vitamins or minerals or for detoxifying measures all these can be harmful in excess antidepressants are also sometimes prescribed during benzo withdrawal and have been helpful to some others disagree and believe they only complicate matters and many antidepressants have their own withdrawal which you will have to deal with at some point beta blockers can be used to help control severe palpitations and muscle tremors during withdrawal while they have little or no effect on psychological symptoms they can help relieve the severity of some physical symptoms again like with all medications you need to consult with your doctor and they should be used only if needed beta blockers should also be tapered slowly if you have taken them for any length of time there are plenty of other medications and natural supplements to discuss but I'm not going to be able to cover them today so please do your own research and consult with your physician number 15 keep mentally active more and more studies show that keeping your mind active is key to keeping it healthy this goes double for people with anxiety and triple for people going through benzo withdrawal if you're currently working keep working don't quit unless you need to if you aren't working find something to keep you busy learn something take an online class read books volunteer learn a language there may be days when you feel you can't do anything and that's okay but when you can do so sitting around focusing on your symptoms is hard to escape we all do it and no one is judging some analysis of your symptoms is important if for no other reason than to know if it is a symptom of withdrawal or possibly something unrelated that is why it is good to have a trusted physician if you can if for no other reason than to help you run tests and to diagnose symptoms from time to time but once you get checked out and are assured that it's just another symptom then it's time for some distraction keeping your mind busy during this time is essential and this can include forms of distraction like entertainment puzzles reading family friends socializing you name it media can also be helpful during this time like movies TV music the internet but do be cautious media can also be triggers monitor your reactions and know what is healthy and what is not for you the main thing is to find other things for your mind to focus on than your own symptoms it's important to keep your mind busy and distraction can be a useful tool at this but there is another side to this and it also needs to be considered number 16 don't fear your emotions distraction only takes you so far avoidance is rarely a long-term strategy at some point you have to face life you have to face your injury you have to face your current state you have to try to reach acceptance and this includes facing your emotions many people in benzo withdrawal especially those of us in protracted withdrawal know that the return of emotions is a significant part of our recovery when you go through withdrawal and the drugs that have been numbing your nervous system eases their control something bizarre starts to happen emotions come back and sometimes with a vengeance when I hit protracted withdrawal the floodgates opened for me and the emotions poured in some of it was about the benzos and what had been done to me and what I had lost but some of it was also crap that had been stuffed deep inside me from decades ago I also had anger and irritability and that is still one which I deal with today I get easily triggered and I become irritable or downright pissed off <laughs> and I have to deal with it now thankfully I read some really good books by some really smart people during withdrawal and one of the lessons learned was to embrace my emotions don't avoid them don't suppress them experience them this doesn't mean act on them 
That is especially true in anger. Acting in the heat of things with anger can have devastating consequences. It means to feel the feelings and not run away from them. You can accept the feelings and still let the thoughts that triggered them go. Let the intrusive thoughts pass, but accept the feeling that comes along. The other option is to avoid or suppress, and well, that's exactly the type of behavior that got me into this mess. For many of you, that was also true, and that's what we were prescribed these drugs for. We are human, and we feel. It's a fact. But unfortunately, we're out of practice. We haven't had to deal with these for a long time. And they come along very strongly. So it's scary, it's frightening, and it is difficult. Finding a balance in this whole thing is what's most important. There are times when distraction and even avoidance is the best answer. There are other times when embracing the emotions, feeling the sadness, feeling the anger is also important. Find what works for you. Get some counseling if that's going to help. Speak to a therapist, speak to a psychiatrist, or somebody else who can help you through some of the difficulties of this time. I am not a therapist by any means, so please remember, this is just my opinion. Number 17. Tread lightly and be grateful. That's right. Lighten up and be thankful is what I'm basically saying here. Now, I'm not trying to belittle Benza withdrawal at all. For some of us, it is the hardest challenge we will ever undertake in our lives. But that doesn't mean we have to give in to its demons. I caught myself doing something during my withdrawal, which in hindsight looks really ridiculous. After a hard week of symptoms, I might get this moment of happiness, even of extreme happiness, just like that, out of the blue. And like all good, anxious people, I suppressed it. That's right. I blocked it and told myself I can't be happy now. I'm still in withdrawal, and it's only going to get worse. So how can I let myself be happy? How stupid is that? <laughs> Life is a balance of good and bad, and if I let the thought of bad that might be coming in the future suppress the good I feel now, what am I left with? It just would be bad all the time. Eventually, I started to cling to these happy thoughts. And I hung on to them as if my life depended on it. I even started a gratitude practice and wrote down three things each night before bed, which I was grateful for from the day. And it helps. In fact, I started getting more happy moments. And they started to last longer. I also started watching more comedy shows on TV instead of dramas. I stopped watching the news. This was big for me. And one I still follow. And you know what? I haven't missed it one bit. I laughed more, and even though I still cried, I enjoyed it more. I felt it, and I wasn't scared of it. I was starting to be human again. I was starting to return to the human race, and it felt good. Don't be afraid to let the good in, even if you're still in the middle of the bad. Be grateful for all that you have. Develop habits to help you focus on those gratitudes. When you have a happy moment, hang on to it, cling to it, squeeze it for all you can get out of it. This condition is temporary, and treading lightly through it can help a great deal. Number 18. Make use of the time. Benzo withdrawal is hard. Like I said, for some of us, it's the hardest experience of our lives. And it can take a while, even years for some like me. But that time doesn't have to be wasted. Benzo withdrawal is perhaps the perfect time to get to know yourself. It's the perfect time for introspection. And why not make use of that time? We experience the world through our internal filters, millions of them and they affect what we see and experience. If we don't know what these filters are, if we can't see them in action, then we are blind to their effects, and we won't know the difference. Benzo withdrawal gave me insight into myself, 
And that's a pretty amazing gift. One I keep exploring and learning from every day, but unfortunately, one I didn't really think about before this all happened. Make use of this time. Rediscover your passions, your likes and dislikes, your loves and losses. Reevaluate your values and see if they still hold true for you. Rediscover your faith, if you have one, and rely on it as a support. Find out who you are and, and use that information to help guide your new life on the other side. Number 19. Be kind and let your body heal. I think some people are surprised when I say that being kind is an important part of recovery and benzo withdrawal, but I'm not kidding here and I'm not going to make light of this. Be kind. That's it. It's a real simple message. Just be kind to everyone, friends, enemies, family, strangers, yourself, especially yourself. It all starts at home. Be kind to yourself. I learned to not judge myself so harshly during this time. If I messed up with my withdrawal, that's okay. I'm going to make mistakes and I'm going to be okay. I learned to let it go and move on. I needed to take care of myself first, especially during this time. I set boundaries and let those who love me know what they were. I found quiet time whenever I could to allow my body and mind to heal. I treated myself to small pleasures to help raise my spirits and my self-esteem. I also had to remember to be kind to those around me. Most people don't really understand what we're going through. How can they? So help them. Realize that this is hard for them too. I get it. It's frustrating when people don't understand the scope of our illness. But how can anyone genuinely understand this who hasn't experienced it? We need to be patient with those around us. Just like us, they're doing the best they can with what they have. Help them understand and help them help you. And finally, number 20. Celebrate your new life. Once you get through withdrawal, and you will, you have a new life awaiting you. It's what some of us like to call the rainbow on the other side. Many people who have experienced benzo withdrawal think of it as a rebirth, a new life with millions of new opportunities. This is true for me. Even though I still have a lot to learn, I am a better person now. I like myself better now. It's that type of change that rarely comes without a significant life struggle. Once you come out the other side, or even as you start to feel better, celebrate. For some of us, we went through hell and came out the other side and we're better for it. So celebrate this. All we have to do is stop and smell the roses. Literally, seriously, just stop and smell them. <laughs> When's the last time you stopped whatever you are doing and smelled a flower? or watched a butterfly, or a child play on the playground, or even just the flicker of a single candle. We get so wrapped up in ourselves, and during Benza withdrawal, that is so easy to do. I did it all the time. But while we're so wrapped up, we miss everything around us. We miss all the good. We miss all the joy. We miss nature. We miss the music. We miss all these things happening. This is a second chance, so seize it. You know, one good habit I think that is almost critical in benzo withdrawal is keeping some type of journal, some type of record. It is so easy for us to start to feel better, to start to do better, to start to have less symptoms, yet still consciously think we're not doing well. What helps me is I open up my journal, an old journal from a couple years ago or three years ago during withdrawal, and I look and see where I was. And I'm amazed at how far I have come. Our memory can be short. It's good to have that reminder of, hey, I've come a long way. Life is good, and we need to embrace it and celebrate it and enjoy it when we get through all this. And that wraps up our feature. 
please remember that all these 20 tips were just that. They were just tips. They were things that I felt might be important to remember during withdrawal. Find what works for you. Use the ones that help you. Work with your doctor. Work with your counselor. Get the support you need. And find what works for you. You're going to get through this. Benzo withdrawal is temporary. It does end. Before we get to our moment of peace, bear with me for about 30 seconds for our disclaimer. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice in any way. The host of this podcast is not a medical professional, nor is he engaged in rendering medical health or psychological advice nor any other kind of personal professional services. The views and opinions expressed by our listeners and interview guests on this podcast, whether read from textual submissions or presented in their own voice, do not necessarily reflect those of the Benzo Free Podcast or of its host. Withdrawal tapering or any other change in dosage of benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepines, or any other prescription drugs should only be done under the direct supervision of a licensed physician. Our full disclaimer can be viewed on our website at benzofree.org slash disclaimer. And that brings us to our closing, our moment of peace. It's just one minute, and it's an opportunity to quiet your mind a bit before you return to the chaos of the real world. The way this works is that I will give you a brief introduction, perhaps a suggestion of something to focus on. Then I will play a soft bell, which will indicate the start of the one minute. This will be followed by another soft bell, which will indicate the end of one minute. And that will be the end of the episode. Feel free to continue to meditate if you choose. If not, continue on with your day. Please remember that you should only do this if you are in a safe place, where you can close your eyes, relax, and let the world pass by without you for a minute. Today we are going to return to another old standard, listening meditation. This is another one of my favorites. It's quite simple, actually. There's no mantra and no single thing to focus on like your breath. You just listen. Listen to the sounds around you. No need to identify them or try to describe them or even name them. Just notice them. That's all there is. When one passes, notice the next one that comes along. Let's get started. Close your eyes and relax. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second and let it out slowly. Let's do that again. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second and let it out slowly along with all the stress of the day. One more time. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. Then let the breath out slowly, relaxing your entire body. Now just breathe slowly and naturally. And listen to the world around you. If your mind wanders, just gently bring it back to your breath again. No judgment whatsoever. Continue to do this for one minute.
Our next episode is episode 32, and it will be released next Wednesday. Thank you again for joining me today, and please, let me know how we did. Keep calm, taper slowly, and take care of yourself. I'll see you next time.